What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Real Bodybuilding Podcast. This is episode number 134, I believe, I think. And I'm with my man, uh, John Jewett. How are you, sir? I am doing excellent. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, last time I had you on, you were mid-prep or end of your prep, so we didn't get a good chance to have a long conversation. Or was it after your show that I had you on? Man, it was the day before my show. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. I remember because I didn't want to keep, I remember talking to you and thinking, I want to talk to you more, but I didn't want to keep you long because I, yeah, that's right. Because you were like right before the show and I'm like, I can't keep this guy too long. So yeah, we're, we've uh, completely switched phases. It's like, I was Skeletor face. Now I'm like, <laughs> no, it's not quite there yet, but <laughs> yeah, no, but that's perfect. That's what, that's what we want. So I wanted to ask you on because you have a ton of knowledge and you posted something uh, a couple of days ago about eating in the off season. And so this podcast, for those listening, who, if you're interested, this podcast is going to be heavy on um, a lot of technical stuff. And we're going to get into eating in the off season and how do you set up your off season diet and things like that. And maybe we'll get into some other things, but um, it's definitely gonna be more technical than uh, lifestyle, but um, just a little bit before we get started, how has everything gone since your, show season like how did you feel about your show season let's start there yeah um the intention was to never compete for that long and i remember like when we did our last lot that last episode that we did this was like going to be my last strike at the olympia qualification like that, that was my plan kind of two shows and done but you know how it is like you you get so close i got second at new york second at Indy and you're like, ah, just one more, you know? And, yeah. and, uh, Renee was going to keep competing. So I was like, well, hell what's one more show. I'm going to be there anyway. And then we couldn't travel for passport reasons. So that got pushed it back. You're like, oh, what's a few more weeks. And yeah. it just kind of gets, gets drawn out. Um, o overall, it was a great learning experience along the way because I, I coached myself for all these shows. Yeah. So to be able to peak yourself for five shows, uh, you do you do learn a lot. Um, a as a whole, uh, I felt great about bringing condition and nailing the peak, which is something that I've always been hesitant to do without a coach. Yeah. And so that kind of built some just self-coaching confidence within me. I think I actually finally did bring my best look to the Olympia which uh, is really what you're shooting for. Yeah. I kind of had a decline on my last show, I would say, for Tampa. What did it, uh, sorry to interrupt you, how many, did it end up being four shows plus the Olympia or was it three shows plus the Olympia? Four, four shows plus the Olympia. Wow, okay. So you basically died it all year. Pretty much, yeah. I, I, I didn't necessarily need to do Tampa. I had enough points, but it was only two weeks later. Renee was competing anyway. I'm going to be there. I'm like, hell, might as well just really lock it in. And we just loved competing together so much when we did yeah. Chicago. It, it was just a, a fun experience. Um, lo and behold, Tampa was a mess for us. Um, why, why is that? We, we, um, we Unknowingly, we ended up having COVID on the show day. Um, people be like, why did you compete? It's like, honestly, we didn't know. Yeah. Uh, until it was show day and we're just I, – I laid backstage the whole time – and just pretty much they pushed the show back a couple hours and it was life-saving because I was like, all right, I'll get up and do this. And yeah. but I was barely eating that day, barely drinking fluids because I just I it felt like food was up to my throat. Yeah. It felt like for us going out there, like we had allergies and the sure. allergies got a little bit worse. Yeah. And then on show day, I was like, man, I, I I didn't I slept like shit. And I had that heat, you know, those like like you had a cheat meal and you're sweating all night. It was kind of like that. Like yeah, food yeah. wasn't that gross. I'm like, man, what's going on? Must have had something bad to eat. Yeah. And then fatigue was higher. It's like, well, probably because I slept bad. Mm -hmm. But it was hard to pull out what it what it was. And then Renee, it hit her like after the show. She's like, I feel really terrible, like fatigue and body ache. And like, yeah, man. And so that's when we got tested afterwards. And lo and behold, that's what it was. But yeah, on that Tampa day um it, you had it was kind of a mess for us and renee ended up winning tampa oh okay that was her, yeah that was her first pro win and yeah. she's like man I, I felt like shit that whole day it's like i didn't even get to really embrace the experience like she went straight to being like bed rest after that yeah yeah um and so for us how many sorry. shows sorry how many shows was it between tampa and the next what was the next show after that after tampa yeah was there tampa was the last show yeah, yeah, that was it. Oh, that one. Then you quote went to the Olympia after that. Yeah, that so for how many Renee, weeks? That was, 
so there was two months, I think, between Tampa and the Olympia, right? Or two months or yeah, eight, yeah, it was more? about it was about eight weeks. So how long did it take you to recover from COVID? Mine was it was really weird. It was really short lived. It was like 12 hours of show day. Yeah. I felt terrible. Yeah. And then I felt fine the next day. Really? Um, 100 percent normal. Um you didn't lose for, you didn't lose your smell, you didn't lose your taste, you didn't like none of that stuff. No, no. It was like some allergy symptoms. Yeah. Show day, I had a little bit of fatigue and poor digestion. And that was really it. Um, I, I'm type O blood. I don't know if that's a thing about response. I hear all kinds of stuff. I'm not going to yeah, get into that. Yeah. But know, yeah. Um, Renee had hit her really hard. Like she was like two weeks of her just laying around eating what you could. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the opposite of really what you want when you're did she, in Olympia. <laughs> did she lose smell and taste and all that or no? Yeah. She, she had like the whole gambit of yeah. all, all, all the issues. Yeah. So um, yeah, she had basically two weeks of just, being really sick and then it's like well hey are you going to skip the olympia like how do you do that um yeah, we yeah. kind of knew going into it this it might not be optimal but this is a shot at the olympia so you don't you don't really pass on those opportunities i mean i even messaged you kind of about yeah. that too yeah of course. Um, it's like you never know when that might be your only chance to do the olympia and renee knew she wasn't at her best at the olympia um but again it's the Olympia. You're the first wellness Olympian. So it's, it's pretty cool experience. Not to, uh, not to dwell on it, but just because I had COVID, um, when I got back from Dallas, I think it was the first week of November and I lost taste and smell and I have my taste back, but my smell is not hundred percent back. Is she experiencing any of that or no? No, she's, uh, she's hundred percent back to normal. Yeah. Yeah. I still can't smell everything properly. So it's like, I don't know. She said that was the worst part of it for her. The taste um, was the, the taste was the worst part for me. And I'm not really not like, you know, that heavy fatigue and body ache. Yeah. Like that seems terrible, but this it still said it was the taste maybe because she was post-show. Yeah. And so we had like our <laughs> goodies, you know? Yeah. 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 And she's like, I don't even want anything. Like, I can't even fucking taste it. I'm like, uh, yeah, it tastes like shit. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, yeah, um, no, that was, that was probably the worst part for me. I remember there was like three days where, I everything I drank, it was even just water, like what drank or ate, all I could taste was like a steel metal, like aluminum -y taste in my throat or chemical taste. I couldn't even make out what the taste was. It tastes like steel or chemical or something, but um that lasted for like three days. But I lost a lot of weight. Like I actually got more shredded through COVID. So it was kind of <laughs> it's kind of kind of a good thing. But um so anyway, so you guys did the Olympia together. How was that experience? Yeah. How was that experience? Uh it was it, it was really cool um, to compete as a couple together at that high level is, is amazing. I mean, you know, like walking on the stage, it's just you alone and taking in that experience. Uh, and then your family's usually out in the stands and you, they don't really quite share it at the same, but to he have her, like we're both backstage yeah, and all leading up right to the stage. Like she's right there with me, like looking at my, like, you know, posing oil yeah. and like cheering me on right when I come off. It, it's just like, that was more, of the value and the experience versus just the outcome of, of the show. Of course. And yeah. that's how we felt the whole way along. Um, and, and it went, went both ways. And it's so rewarding because I'm, I'm coaching Renee. So to, to have her out there, it's like being out there twice at the Olympia. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a, uh, it's definitely, you know, it's an emotional experience. Like even at Tampa, like her win, I was backstage. I was, I was crying like in tears, you know, <laughs> and uh, she came off like a zombie. <laughs> I'm yeah. all emotional. Yeah. She's all like, you know, fatigued. And uh, it, it was just, it was, it was such a cool thing to go through all, all those aspects of the Olympia, the meet and greet, walking to the show, just all, all um, there with her. Was, yeah, yeah. Was really you guys seem like you have a, a really good relationship. It's like very symbiotic. Like, so is there during prep, is there any, issues or are you guys like just each other's cheerleaders and everything's great because you're <laughs> yeah, prepping all, i can only imagine over here. <laughs> well I can, I can only imagine prepping for an entire year you know and your wife is also prepping or and it's yeah. like it's there's got to be some tumultuous times no or you guys like have figured out how to make each other happy during that whole prep well it, it helps like uh personality wise we're, we're very very similar I mean, we're, she's like a carbon copy of, of me. Like we're both a little bit more introverted. So if, if things are getting challenging, we, we kind of shell in mm -hmm. and don't have more of that outward 
expression of it. So we might be a little bit more quiet um, yeah. with each other. And then, but also what's helpful is that we have, the, we understand the mindset of the other person. So if you're hungry or fatigued or whatever, like the other person gets it. Yeah. Um, and also there's like that disconnection a little bit with, with intimacy, intimacy. And I don't mean like, you know, phys- like physical, just in, in general, like emotional kind of connection. Yeah. And yeah. you're both there with it. So, you know, uh, in bed at night, you're looking at food porn. That's what you do instead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's, uh, and with coaching her too, um, it's still fairly a disconnected thing. Like I, I email her, her check-ins really? and stuff. And that response is there. But even then, Renee's really good about taking feedback and not having it be in a, an emotional uh, connection there. Or like this is her husband talking to her versus her her coach. Yeah. Um, also on my end, I make sure to be very strategic in how I do word things. And I think it's helpful that I'm never policing her because I think yeah. that's when people get in trouble. Like if one of uh, the, you know, one, one spouse is just not quite a hundred percent on yeah. and they don't want the husband to be policing all day long with that judgment. And Renee's not like that. If anything, it's me trying to like, she's asked like, what else can I do to get better? Yeah. So if anything, it's like, making sure I'm saving her from herself from like digging a hole. So it's, it's just, it's just a good dynamic. Um, yeah. Not going to work for everybody. Um, but that's it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a really interesting um, dynamic because it's not just a couple. You're also her coach. So you're sending your email. So you're actually completely disconnected as the coach. So yeah, you're not, that's so, so like, sorry to interrupt, but like when you're sending, no, you're when you're sending emails or you're getting photos and you do the whole coaching thing, it's two hours later and now you're hanging out on the couch. You've, <laughs> you've put away the, the coaching role. Like you're not talking about coaching at that point. You've separated it completely or is there a little bit of dialogue all day long? It's, it's progressed to where there is some dialogue. When, I, when we first set out like, hey, I'll, I'll coach you for these shows. Let's do it this way. Because in, in my, my previous marriage, I, I coached my, my ex for a show and it, it was really hard. Yeah. Um, not the right dynamic at all. So I'm like, you know what, well, how can we do this? Let me separate it. Be like a normal client. Here's your anonymous coach email coming back to you. Yeah. Hey, babe, what did coach say to you today? Um, <laughs> and, and so that's how it kind of started. But as we realized how we understood each other's situations and how that response was, we got comfortable with giving some in-person feedback and, you know, daily I would be looking at her, you know, just in person yeah. and, and having that, you know, I might reserve the feedback um, and, and think about it. And I think that's, what's helpful because with a normal email response and you have a client respond to you, you might have to like some pause and think about it before you have this emotional reaction to give back to a client. And I think that's what can hurt with the in-person stuff with, with yeah. a spouse is yeah. you see me you're like, you know, you, you give this reaction that uh, they might take up incorrectly. Sure. So I might, hey, assessor, okay, look, let's see how you're looking. And then I might then change the plan and make, make some changes and maybe talk about it later. But she gives me that time to think about it and not ask for those changes right, right away. Perfect. So we, we've gotten to a point where I can look at her in, in person and give some, give some critiques. It's not taken up, up personally. So let me ask you this side note, because I'm always thinking about cheat meals. <laughs> when you're coaching yourself and you give yourself a cheat meal, do you try and make it so that she has her cheat meal at the same time? Or do you not worry about trying to connect them? Cause she's your wife. So you want to have the cheat meal with your wife. So are you like yeah. trying to line them up or are you just not? No, they do line up sometimes. And, uh, I'll be honest, sometimes we're like, hey, let's dig a little harder these next few days yeah. and uh, we'll both have this meal together, you yeah. know, but, but of course, like if we're that deep into prep and close, like, hey, we have to do what we have to do. Like sometimes the other person will get more food and other people won't. And, and, and usually in that case, it'll be more of like, let's run just a higher carbohydrate day of the same foods and not having someone go out to a, a restaurant and sit there while the other person can. So it, it's uh, it's fairly managed. But there's, there were some times where like, oh man, I'm going to, I'm going to throw some sushi down and like, Hey, you can't do it just yet. And so wait, wait, was, in, that, in that scenario, do you go like with a buddy or do you just sit there and eat sushi in front of her? <laughs> in that situation, I, I, I brought it home. <laughs> no way. He just, yeah. like, Oh, how does she handle it? Does she like, does she, is she uh, cool about it or is she like, go eat it in another room? Fine. No, yeah. no, she, she's okay. And sometimes we'll try to make a, the compromise meal for her. like, Hey, let's do some like, seared ahi tuna yeah. for your yeah. protein and some veggies so you're like kind, kind of, of get it. 
Yeah. It's not the same, but no, you know, um, <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> but but um, again, like for both of us, we both are focused on like trying to win this thing. So right. it's understood and it, it's okay. But yeah. in, in the off season situation, we, we plan that out for sure. Yeah. Like we've got to have our, our date nights, our restaurant meals. Of course, we're going to do those together. That's the, that's the time to do it. So we understand that when we're at prep, like we'll have those times, but for right now, we just have to have to do what we need to. That's what we, that's what we signed up for. As a coach, do you feel like a mental break is as important as a physical break? I do. I do, actually, because I, I truly believe, like, the mental side carries over into the physical. Um, I have been more of a stickler with, like, giving just cheat meals. Um, I haven't found them to be hugely beneficial from just the actual physiological side. Yeah. But I had some some clients, this was in the past, where the, the mental side was such a huge stressor of taking him out of his, his social life that it was bleeding into like leading to higher fatigue and body weight, like climbing during the week, during these diet phases. He's like, hey, man, I just really want to take my wife out. And it wasn't really about the meal. It was more like just breaking away from the daily stress of life. Yeah. And I did that. And he, he just responded even more, even better. So I think there's situations around that. Um, but again, I think if that is the issue, it's probably needed to also have some issues to mitigate some of that stress around the social settings. Uh, like with regard, like, you know, if you're going to be really good at bodybuilding, you're going to have to make some lifestyle sacrifices that don't probably revolve around being highly social individual. And like for this, this instance, that person had like a night and day difference between prep and off season. So the off season wasn't the best off season because of that. And then you're having to switch into prep mode and, and then it's, it's never, it, you always go back to this unproductive off season and those aren't carried out th throughout those, those routines that you build in prep that are, can be really beneficial in the off season, which I kind of leads into what you're, you're asked about, like yeah. hey, getting fat in the off season, right? Like, yeah. You know, I, well, the reason I, the reason I brought it up is John was always a very, um, John, John always thought very highly of the mental break. He was like, you know, if you need to go out with your wife, you need to go with your girlfriend, you need to go with your husband, your boyfriend, whatever, you need to go with your family. Maybe your kids want to go for a meal. Like it's important to give uh, the person the break to, to get them back on track and keep them focused. Um, obviously I don't think John meant that when you're six weeks out or four weeks out or any time in a prep, if you don't need it, but um I know, I know John felt like if in a prep, if somebody could get away with it, if they had a good off season where they didn't get too fat and they weren't too fat going into their prep, he, he could probably give them a cheat once every other week or something like that to keep them mentally focused. He believed in, in keeping that person stress-free, I guess you'd say. Um, so I just want to show real quick before we get into uh, what I wanted to talk about, I just want to show your Instagram real quick for anybody not following John Jewett. It's John J O for those listening. It's J O H N Jewett is J E W E T T three. So John Jewett three. So you have these, all these initials uh, under your name here and you have J three university before you get to your credit, uh, creditions can, is it creditions? Is that a word? <laughs> it can be <laughs> yeah, my, my, my credentials, my your credentials. My, my That's the word I'm looking for. I just made up, a, I just made up a word. No. Um, what is, can you explain what J three university is? Yeah, it's, it's just kind of been my uh, accumulation of knowledge competing throughout the years and through my, my background in, in university and being nerdy, but trying to bridge those gaps. And I've had lots of clients over the years where I'm having to like constantly repeat myself and teach things. So I want to teach my clients the whys behind what we do so they understand the type of feedback to give me and how to make themselves better. So J3 University was kind of came about by being uh, how do you make yourself better? How do you coach people better? And so this is my course that takes you from day one of physique assessment into bodybuilding of how do you optimize recovery? How do you set up your nutrition, your training? What do you do for health monitoring if you are an enhanced bodybuilder using physique enhancing drugs? Mm -hmm. What do you do with physique enhancing drugs? And then how do you carry that out into a successful like yearly off season and contest prep with all the ins and outs of what do you do on peak week? Do you water load? Do you use diuretics, et cetera? And so this has been the, uh, the physique enhancement one-on-one course. Um, but I also have some high level pros 
that are taking it too. And uh, so it's not just for a beginner at all. This is actually really, really extensive. I didn't realize there was this much involved. So I'm going through your, for those listening, if you go to j3university.com, you can see exactly what I'm looking at here. But um, I'm going through, so how does this work? It says lesson one overview. And for those listening, this isn't, this wasn't planned. I didn't, John, <laughs> John didn't ask me to go through this. I'm just actually genuinely curious. So lesson one, like what, do you, what is this? Like once a week is, do they get like an ebook? Like how does that work? Yeah, so it's it's a self-paced course. So the lessons come up as on your own time. So okay. and, and then they open up as you complete each lesson. There's a quiz at the end, end of each lesson, each a video lecture. So it's just like us here, video and me going through a PowerPoint is also accompanied by a PDF format of that as well. So you can have that like the quick notes to review. Um, there's also a live streams that we do weekly. Yep. for the students on there to ask questions. And then we also have a forum with me just on there answering any questions fully in depth as well. So you go through all these lectures and I've had um, like uh, Chris Tuttle, he's yeah. a dietitian bro. He went through this thing in like two weeks. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he like blazed through it. I have other people that just like, hey, I'm in school. I wanna watch lectures here and there. Yeah. Perfect, you know, take as long. You have lifetime access with, with it. Um, so that's- I, Sorry, John. I have another question I just wanted to ask you is, do they have to go module one, module two, or can they buy like whatever module they want? No, it, it comes in its entirety. And okay. the idea is to take them through that step process, just like I would of, of assessing a client. What do you need from, from your stage picks? Where do you go from there? Well, that's going to determine how I set up nutrition, how I set up training. So it's not like, hey, just watch this nutrition and you know what to do. It, it all kind of builds upon itself. Um, yeah, that's really interesting, man. I, I, with that kind of information, I almost feel like people have no excuse anymore. There's so well, part of the issue is actually, so much information out there, right? It's hard to know where to go. How much does this cost, John? It, it's a uh, six ninety five for the core cur curriculum, and then if you see at the top there, there's like applied hypertrophy optimization. Yeah, that's a one off module of just twelve lessons of in the gym. How do, how do you train biceps and get more out of every rep? Oh, okay. So how do you set up, you know, say a bicep curl for yourself based on your alignment and ability to do so? Um, that's, that's just a, a one module you could run. The same with uh, the post-contest optimization. That was a new module I made for what do you do post-show for nutrition, training, PDs? What do you do if you have multiple shows? How yeah, do you yeah. set up that? So someone buys this module, this one-off, you said, if they don't want to buy the full curriculum, they can buy this one-off and it's 12 lessons. So yeah. this was this uh, main curriculum you said is 695? Yes. Like $695. $695, yeah. <laughs> but you're basically, I mean, it sounds, I'm, for those people listening, it sounds like a lot of money, but if, if you go to the website, if you're not watching and you look at this, it's literally, I feel like, and I, I don't wanna offend anybody, but I feel like you almost would get more out of this than hiring a coach. Like it's very, very extensive. You're literally, literally going through every single thing somebody would need. Like for somebody who just started, had no idea about bodybuilding, they could buy that and be very well versed by the time they were done. Absolutely. It, it took yeah. me a year to record all those lectures. I mean, there's over 58 lectures, um, hours and hours of, of me doing these videos. So you would have a, a extremely well versed of the whys behind what you're doing, but also real world application. So I have like Renee and I's like case studies, presentations of like, hey, this was my picks on week one of off season. Here's my picks on week two. This is me explaining why I'm making the changes and what I'm seeing in these pictures. Cause I think it helps teach people how to have the eye for bodybuilding yeah. and what you're learning in the course, you're seeing it applied in real life too. And I think that's where we see the disconnect with a lot of this stuff. Like, sure. We can talk about studies and theory all day, but I want to see where the rubber meets the road. That's right. And that's with real life experience and that's why some people write off just some of these guru coaches because they don't know all the science. Like, it, well, they can produce the results. Like, how how good of evidence do you need there? It's anecdotal, but it's evidence nonetheless. Yeah. So, I want to put all that together in a digestible package. Teach people how to bodybuild, how to physique enhance, but also do it in, in, in a risk 
mitigating way. So to lower the risk, we know like buy bill is not going to be healthy, but my, my big thing here, and especially with everything going on in, in the past years is, is trying to do this in a a little bit less risky way. Yeah. And that requires kind of digging through some, some science and, and medical papers on, on what can we do for health around physique enhancing drugs to try to put out quality information that can, that can help people do this and still compete at the Olympia. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, I know a lot of people take the most simplistic approach to talking about health and it's like, well, it's the drugs and that's it. It's the amount of drugs they're taking. My, my approach is maybe a little, a little bit more nuanced. I seem to think it's a multiple of things, but one of them being, is it, can you ever be healthy if you're carrying around 250 to 300 pounds of mass, even if you're off? Like even if a person is taking four months, you know, or three months off in between cycles and cleaning out and all these things and very, watching their diet, and not getting too fat and, you know, all of these different things that we do to stay healthy. Do you think, I know you said bodybuilding can't be healthy, but it can be healthier to a point where, sure. where it won't look bad, correct? Or no? What do you think? Yeah, well, it probably exists along a spectrum, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and very genetically driven too of your response. Sure. So if you're, as far as like the farther up you reach beyond your genetic ceiling, probably the more risk you're going to be imposing. Mm-hmm. And then the, the further up the scale with physique enhancing drugs, you're moving up probably the more risk that you're exposing to. So, you know, can, can you, how do you even quantify that? It's hard to, yeah. but I would say you could do this in a, I, I can't say it's a safe approach. I can just say it's a, a, a decreased like harm, you know, sure. um, but there's very liable to be harm, harm done. Yeah. Uh, it's just, maybe that's just seen way down the line and it's hard to just have data that kind of quantifies that. Mm -hmm. Um, So, but I I agree. It's not just the drugs. It's not, it's just being, being just a high body weight in general. And we see this across, it's just uh, obesity, but, uh, or even professional athletes, like say alignment, you know, they carry significantly high lean mass, but also a lot of body fat too. Just being a large person individual, you're putting more strain on all organ systems Mm -hmm. Um, that coupled with high intakes of food, high training, just a, a cumulative stress, allostatic load is what we would, we would call it. And then also drugs on top of it. Yeah. yeah you're, you're driving a lot towards poor health outcomes. Yeah. Um, but y- you, you can do this to try to decrease the risk as much as possible. Sure. So I want to ask you, I, I know there's, there's, I'm sorry, we keep going off on different areas, but I just <laughs> have a, a ton of questions whenever I get to talk to you. So you mentioned something about genetics. And I just want to ask you this because I was talking some, to somebody about it and they brought up a really good point is uh, people speak of genetics in terms of muscle mass or how shredded someone can get or how the muscle looks. Most people don't talk about genetics in terms of how well their body can process drugs. Like I've heard the term, I've heard the term hyper responders, obviously. So people sure. say, well, that guy's a hyper responder. So when he takes drugs, he gets bigger than somebody else who took the same amount of drugs. But what I'm, what I'm referring to is your blood work. Like is, does genetics also play a major part in how clean your blood work is? Because if you can process the drugs faster, can you eliminate the toxins faster? Like, can your body metabolize the drugs faster and get them out? Or is any of that, is all that just bro science? No, it's not all. And we just see like, just in general, health markers have a large genetic response. Um, look, look at individuals with diabetes and increasing food amounts and you have an individual that would have a higher exposure to in- increased insulin resistance. Yeah. But uh, we also know snow like drug response is different too. I actually just wrote a whole paper on this for, uh, for animal about um, steroids don't dictate success. Yeah. And uh, the premise of the article was looking around the genetic response of training is all is different for each person. We have people that have very poor responses to training and in even along that nutrition responses and so you could like overfeed someone by a thousand calories um, per, per day. Some people won't even gain weight while yeah. others would overshoot fat gain. Um, that, that would be even not to meet those calories, like the math, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. of what that is. So it's like, okay, well, that's a genetic response just alone. Uh, but even with, you know, PEDs, um, there's an enzyme responsible for like the processing of, 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 
testosterone like an anthe, like the esters, like breaking down these esters. And people, some people express more of that enzyme. So you see like individuals that maybe they take 200 milligrams and they have this rise in the serum to a thousand nanograms per deciliter of testosterone while someone else only comes up to 500. Mm -hmm. And so just that response of processing a drug could be different, but also then how does that drug interact with the, with the androgen receptor? Then how does that drug interact at the DNA level for protein synthesis? Like all of those are genetically controlled and all those responses are vastly different. Mm -hmm. And uh, you even see it in like the testosterone dosage study, like in general, more works more, but also you have these standard deviations where some, some individuals just didn't gain as much muscle in the same dosages yeah. while others gain more. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it is definitely genetically controlled, but, but health is absolutely. Um, but there are some controllable factors within that too, what we do with training and nutrition. But again, those responses are also dictated by genetics. So it is, a uh, it's, it's heavily controlled. Right. So then when someone says that's really interesting. So basically when somebody says I have the answer to X, there's not really an answer because everybody's different. Right. So if I say to you, like, uh, like a popular, a popular debate, me and me and Greg Doucette have all the time is he thinks you need like, uh, I don't know. I forget what he said, 200, 300 calories more than, uh, maintenance in the off season. And I'm like, no, you need more. And we have this bul bulking versus main gating debate. Right. <laughs> From what, based on what you're saying, it's kind of a moot point because, somebody could need more and somebody could need less to gain the same amount of muscle and not as not gain as much fat. Yes. Yes. And no. Um, so when we're looking at like, say a, a research study, you might have some outcomes that show an average response, which okay. for most of these individuals on average, this could hold true. Okay. Um, but you have outliers within that too, yeah. but you might have people within that group that it showed the opposite. Sure. But so I think we still have some things like in general, this applies, but you're still going to have to cater around that individual. Sure. And so I think that's where people look at research studies and take away like these, these hard black and white points, and man, it's, it's net usually never like that. Yeah. Um, it's like, here's some averages. We have some better understandings of how one variable might work. And then we can maybe try to understand what we're seeing in the field more. And, but even then it still comes down to applying it to that individual, it's, yeah. whether it's that individual needs 300 calories more or a thousand calories more to grow. It's going to be based on that individual's response. If you see someone get super fat on thousand calories, it's like, well, yeah, they're going to need less. Um, so does that hold statement of they only should have 300 calories more hold true? No, not for everybody. Yeah. So it's, uh, they're, that's what people don't like is that there's so much gray and they want hard they want answers. To, that's right. They're just not there. Um, but I think having the basis of understanding of, of where this comes from, it gives you, gives you the application to help coach people. Sure. So I don't want to use just that example. Just Greg, if you're watching this, this is not a tax <laughs> on you. No, I, uh, no, I don't want to use just that. The, the other example I was thinking of is test because I've had a lot of pros on the show. And I usually get around some way to, you know, answer, you know, asking the question, like, how much test have you taken, whatever, like, what is a normal dose, because I want people to kind of be informed. And usually, sure. it come, it, usually it's, you know, some guys will say 500. And I, I really don't think they're lying. Some guys will be like, Oh, 500 is good for me. Some people will be like, Oh, I need 1500. And it, that could be along the same point, like somebody could be getting the same benefit from you know, 500 as somebody else getting the same benefit from 15, right? I mean, that's, we're talking about the same type of thing, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, just from this paper I, I, I wrote here, it's the, the subjects in the study, they were given um, 500 milligrams of testosterone and they injected intramuscularly, and they looked at the serum testosterone levels. And uh, subjects with a specific variation in this gene that I was talking about were classified as hyper responders and had testosterone levels three times higher than the low responders. We had someone like same testosterone dose, but three times the elevation in testosterone. Is there somewhere I can see the article you're looking at or is it on your own computer? It's on my own computer. Oh, okay. yeah. It's just, a, it's an article that I wrote Okay. for, for animal, but sorry, go on. Yeah. Um, so it is, and it also, so that's the part of the genetic response, but also, it, it has to do with experience level two of that, that athlete and where they've been able to maximize all the other variables, right? So say say you had someone that was taking 300 milligrams of testosterone and someone else taking the same amount, 
Carson Eggs nails nutrition, training, et cetera. They're making most of all the variables. That's going to carry them for a lot farther than, say, the other guy taking 300 milligrams that, you know, slacks in nutrition, not quite nailing training. He's going to be like, oh, man, 300 milligrams isn't doing as much as 300 milligrams for this other guy. I need to crank it up to 500 milligrams. And I think you see that a lot with inexperienced uh, bodybuilders coming up, using a lot. And then as you get more advanced, you make so much more of the other variables and within your lifestyle that you're like, oh man, I'm kind of growing off less. It's yeah. like, are, are, is it that it's just working better? No, not necessarily. You're making more of all the other variables. Um, so it's like, oh man, I was using way too much back then. Well, no, you're probably just doing all the other things uh, too poorly. And you should have started with less. So you didn't mask that poor nutrition and training with drugs. I see. Um, and I've, I can attest to this myself, like starting on bodybuilding, I used pretty high dosages mm-hmm. re- relevant. And it was a lifestyle that I was working two jobs. Um, I had more stress, sleep would lack many times. I was inconsistent in, in times of meals and training and all the nuances that, that I think matter. Now my lifestyle revolves around optimizing bodybuilding. And so I use a lot less, but at the same token, I'm also not adding like 20 pounds of muscle here either. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, I guess. There's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of nuance, right, in between that conversation. But back to your point, uh, yeah, yeah, I think you absolutely have a genetic response to all these drugs. Okay. You know? um, I'm just going to go back to your uh, Instagram really quick. So this was the post that we that I messaged you about because I thought it was interesting because I constantly get these conversations about getting fat in the off season yeah. and how fat should I get and how much food should I eat and should I bulk or should I main gain or should I stay lean or whatever the, whatever word you want to use. So what, first of all, let's establish what we mean by fat. Like what do you sure. consider fat in the off season? <laughs> of course, that was like kind of a clickbaity term. Of it course. Yeah. A, yeah. I, I had to, I had to soften up to be more politically correct, I guess, but <laughs> anyway, um, uh yeah so i guess you have to say how how fat is too fat and some of this idea came at least in the evidence-based world around p ratio basically it's um the proportion of weight gain that being lean mass to fat mass and this was like this old research paper that was looking at like 44 studies and there are a lot of like untrained individuals and they mm-hmm. were like looking at some people coming from anorexia nervosa and refeeding. So yeah. pretty inaccurate data, but it was kind of showing like the leaner you are, the more lean mass you gain with the least amount of fat gain. Then as you approach higher levels of body fat, that lean mass is decreasing. So your P ratio is kind of worsening. Okay. Well, find out this data was kind of inaccurate in terms of applying to lifting individuals in our, our context. And we, we do have, and we can look at high level athletes. Some of the highest lean body masses in athletes are some of the most obese athletes. Um, mm-hmm. Some of the highest of fat free mass index are like sumo wrestlers. Yeah. Not saying we want to go get the sumo wrestler status, but the, the idea being is that as body fat increases, are you impeding muscle gain? Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's like, are you getting to a level of body fat where you're not able to gain as much muscle tissue? And it, it doesn't seem like that's impeded in a lot of these athletes that we do look at, even um, like linemen would be a good example versus say a, a running back or something. Right. But I think you have to kind of weigh a lot of that in. We just don't have great data, like within the bodybuilding community around, you know, how much body fat should you increase before it gets suboptimal. Um, a lot of people would say that the higher your fat, the higher your body fat, you're the more insulin resistant you are. Yeah. So how does that play a part in what you're saying? Yeah. That's, so the, like, that's, that's like the main, that's the main argument I hear about, right. about people saying, don't get too fat. Yes. And, uh, that, that same argument, if we looked at these, these athletes and they're, there was a study, I recall, looking at some muscle, they put some different football players, different lying, lying positions through a resistance training and looking at mass accrual. And over this time duration between like, you know, the lighter weight football players and like the linemen, like they had the same amount of lean mass gain. Mm-hmm. Actually, the linemen actually gained more muscle mass. And these were the same individuals that would be more insulin resistant. Yeah. So it doesn't seem like there is quite an impedance to hypertrophy adaptation however you do have to look at is there a further distribution of fat gain um 
but you also have to consider like within those positions, like probably that lineman has a genetic predisposition to gain more body fat, but maybe more muscle mass too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think more so the issue here is not necessarily, is it impeding muscle gain, but what does it do on the backside of your off season when you need to diet back down for a contest? That's right. Um, but, but also there is the issue. Yes, you, you will form some insulin resistance. I don't think it quite is impedance for muscle gain, but I think it, it definitely is for health in general. And I think that's going to short live your off season for other reasons that you, you see outside of just like, Hey, do you build muscle or not? Cause most of the time when I'm, when I'm seeing my, my clients get that insulin resistance present, we're seeing blood glucose elevate, usually appetites going down. They're starting to have to force food down. Usually that's when I'm seeing them getting softer too. Yeah. And to further push food for one, it's, it's mentally just struggled to do it, but also I just see them rapidly accumulate body fat and with that being said on the other side of the equation hey i need a diet i'm back down to low body fats uh you might have an extended prep that you might end up losing losing some tissue on the back end to just make up for how much you're going to gain on on the back end of the off season right so there's i think a balance especially for the ped using bodybuilder where health can get detrimented really easily i think keeping body fat lower is important for that reason that we need to monitor health and that we also need to diet back down to get absolutely shredded. So I think that is what puts on the cap, not necessarily that getting to 20% body fat is going to be necessarily limiting to muscle gain. Would you ever let any of your clients get to 20% body fat? Cause I always felt like 15 was like kind of the cap on, uh, yeah. on, on men, not women. Sorry. I should clarify no. No, I, I would. I think I think a good range is probably somewhere between that uh, ten to twenty percent, staying within this this oh, range. You, you'll let them go all the way to twenty. Uh, for it depends on the individual because it's in where that where that person lies comfortably. So okay. you have to say, okay, what's what's the bottom end? Well, the bottom end is probably going to be something where you're you're comfortable and you have no longer any type of dieting adaptations that you might during like a prep, you know, when you push someone low in body fat, you're like, man, sleep's not optimal. Uh, my libido's gone. Like there's hunger signaling is high. You're like, man, I'm just going to stay lean. So I'd make lean gains. It's yeah. like, well, you're in a suboptimal position to grow and that's going to be on a spectrum for everybody. So, so, oh. so that, that crazy lean guy, like, Hey, that Roman Fritz that we, you know, we hate with shredded glutes all year. He might stay at 8% and maybe go to 12 or 13 while say, I don't know, whoever else gets, you know, is not that naturally lean guy, they might be comfortable at that 13% and then have to move up to the 20. Okay. So I just want to clarify. So basically what you're saying for, I'm going to, if I'm wrong, just stop me. Sure. So basically what you're saying is for somebody asking like, where should I be in the off season fat wise, you're saying wherever your body is most comfortable performing all these other acts like sleeping or training or eating or all these things have to be in sync. So the guy who's staying lean and he's missing out on his sleep and he's training is not as optimal and all that. It's pointless. Like he's not, he's doing himself a disservice by staying lean. So you're okay with him going, if he's at 14%, but he's still not sleeping right. And he still feels like he's, you know, not performing at hundred percent. You would let him go to 16, 17, 18% if he has to. I think that would be acceptable. I understand like your example there. Yeah. Um, it, you, I think for most males at 14%, you should have all those other variables really sure. in a good spot. Yeah. I would probably first say like, Hey, you need to get to work on nailing all the variables better because it's likely that's the issue and not that, Hey, you need to add, add more fat and that's going to fix the problem. Usually it's moving more so from a, 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 a let contest lean type of, of state where you have those adaptations. Sure into those body fat where you're all comfortable, that starting point. And then that gives you the runway to add on tissue and body fat for a long off season. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily just, Hey, add fat to feel better, but I think post-show that holds true. Mm-hmm. But once you're at that spot, then we should slow it down and have that incremental increase of some body fat is acceptable to gain. Mm-hmm. Um, I think m- m- less though for an enhanced bodybuilder, uh, because we have the tools to do so, but also from the health aspect that you're probably going to incur more insulin resistance at lower body fat levels than someone that would be natural. Um, 
So can I ask you, so, so if I'm dieting, let's say I get to 5% body fat stage weight or whatever, whatever, I don't, I've never even done my body fat, but let's just say that's that's the number, right? In the off season, I think by how my body looks, I'm probably sit around 12 or 13%. And it seems like that's where my body, like my genetics, like my family is kind of a little bit, not fat, but chubbier. It feels like 12, 13% is where I'm comfortable. So it, my body kind of just goes there. That's where it wants to be. So should somebody kind of eat rationally, like what they should be eating, and if their body goes in that direction, just kind of let it go there? Or should they be forcing it back as long as it doesn't hurt their performance? Uh, I, I think moving up. So say you're coming off post-contest and you know, like, hey, roughly this is where I feel at my best. Yeah. There should be a incremental rate that you get there. Um, so this was in my like post contest module of like, Hey, that first week post show, we want some rapid fat gain to occur. That's, that's acceptable. You're going to have some glycogen weight increase, but after that, we want a probably more aggressive body weight increase back to that point. Probably usually I say four to eight weeks post show to get to that comfortable spot for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, anything beyond that, you're probably fighting yourself to stay leaner and you're probably necessarily maybe close to a calorie deficit to do so when, Hey, that's not the point of the off season. It's, it's trying to get into this surplus and, and have optimal sleep and training, et cetera. You're probably not doing so if you're staying for say for you, Fuad, if you're less than that 12% body fat. So get up to that relatively quickly and start your off season. This like, Hey, I'm going to reverse diet and stay super lean. And then I'm going to make the most of it. I think it's the worst time to build muscle post-show. It's far from this anabolic rebound. If anything, you have for this P ratio, I think you have the most distribution to body fat over muscle gain during that period. And so I don't think you can truly have optimal building until you get to there. Not saying you can't because I've done it, Yeah, yeah, (laughs) you know, but to counteract that um, distribution in an enhanced bodybuilder, you're having to use a larger amount of exogenous drugs to do so. so and No, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So in that post-show state, when you're coming from already having this distribution to body fat in a probably a poor health status, just from prep itself, adding additional PEDs on top of that, I, I think that gives poor sight into not trying to have an extended off season. When you know, like post show, like man, nutrition is going to be like driving crazy training performance anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. hey, make the most out of the least. Let's just do training, food, increase food, bring body fat up quickly. Then when you're at that really optimal state, health markers looking great, then we can push into our off season and escalate PEDs. Not the other way around, because I've done it the other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And usually I find myself eight weeks post show, okay, time to pull back because health is still shit. That's right. And then you pull drugs back, you're like, man, now I'm small and really fat. In the what middle of the off, in the middle of the off season, you're small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay, yeah, that's, um, that's extremely interesting. So because what the new kind of like the new way things have done, like things were different when I was coming up, but around the time I was coming up in probably the, I don't know, I want to say 2005, 2010, reverse dieting became really popular. Yeah. And, and now it's like, everybody's got a reverse diet. It's the way you have to do it. And I feel like, you know, John, people look at me like I'm some old timer because John used to say to me, get back to your weight. Like we would, when we would, when the show was done, he'd be like, get back to your weight. I'd be like, how fast? He'd be like, as fast as you can. He's like, don't, <laughs> he's like, don't just pig out and get, you know, turn to a fat pig. But he's like, you know, get back to your 270, 280, 290 that you're comfortable at so we can get to work. Um, so he's kind of, he kind of said the same thing you're saying is like, don't waste yeah. time trying to stay lean and shredded. Let's get back to it and build from there. Um, yeah. I, but, I think you've seen some other coaches do that along so, the way too. It, it, when I worked with like Matt Jansen, like post show, we, he'd push food hard. And for one, it's great from an adherence standpoint, but also we got back to a productive off season yeah. really quickly. Now you, I think you could, have, you could overshoot body fat and you can yeah. have adipocyte hyperplasia. You could multiply fat cells. So you don't want to do this too quickly. And we also know that you could rapidly accumulate more body fat for any degree of muscle gain. So there's, a, there's like a balance to strike within it too. So you don't want to get back to your 12% body fat week one. No, but it could, I, yeah, yeah. I know what you're saying, yeah. but over this like, you know, reasonable time course for me, for me, it was usually five or six weeks. Yeah. I, yeah. By five or six weeks post show, I was usually sitting around 285. And then we would kind of, 
and like you said, we would go off most stuff and just be kind of cruising with our drugs. But the food, like my body was responding so well to the food that I didn't need it, really? like you said. And then we would kind of go off and then go into our regular off season. So yeah. uh, I always agreed with that. So what, so are these guys nowadays that are trying to stay, you know, 8% body fat, if that's not their com comfortable area, or, you know, they're trying, they're finishing a show and trying to, you know, keep that hard look. They're just doing themselves a disservice moving forward. I, I would, I think, I believe so. That's where I would hold true. If, if their, if their ultimate goal is to build as much mass as possible, I guess that's the, we should preface it with that. I would say so. I would say, look at that person a year and let's see how much muscle they've really built. And, and likely it wouldn't be much. And I think just with social media, it gives us some unreasonable expectations of what you should be doing in your off season. You see these muscular guys staying lean all year, but likely they're the same guys that aren't putting on a lot of tissue anymore. Uh, but the ones that I still see change that are at a more advanced level, they do push into that area where, Hey, you're, you're not going to be, uh, you know, in, in, insta famous, <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to body fat's going to accumulate and you're going to be pushing up into some new body weights and you need to let some acceptable fat gain to, to occur. So I, I think it is a disservice and likely those individuals are also trying to compensate a lot with physique, like drugs use, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so there's a lot, there's a lot of issues, not, not seeing the long-term in bodybuilding that, Hey, to get good at this stuff, you got to do it for like 10 years, not, not just the next, you know, 10 weeks and just to look good for, for some photos. So, so without, I know, I know like whenever I have anybody, um, whenever, whenever I have anybody of your stature on the show, it's hard to get a direct answer because I know that the answers are all have so many variables to them, but if we're going to talk about gaining fat post show and then in the off season, cause I consider them kind of two separate sections. Yeah. How fat, if somebody was to say to you, like, let's say 200 pound guy comes up to you. He was like, I was like 180 on stage. I just finished my show. Can you, can you give us some idea of what it's supposed to look like? Like what, if it's not a reverse diet, what is it? So I think who, who made a, a great term for this was it's a, it's a group called 3DMJ. Um, Eric Helms was one of the, he's a re researcher, but they brought to kind of the, the, the evidence-based world, uh, the recovery diet, which I think is a great term for the, the post-contest period. Um, I, I coined it within J3 University, so credit credit to them. But it's uh, pretty much the balance between, hey, pig out post show and reverse dieting. So it should be this this steady rate. Now, we, uh, just to be clear, were you saying post contest or just off season? What should this kind oh, of rate look like? Or I'm I'm saying right after. Well, I want to get into off season after, but I just want for initially want to go into right after someone finishes a show. It's like the day after, and they say, okay, coach, yeah. what do I? How fast do I get back to my weight, or do I stay lean, or what do I do? Yeah. So again, this is also going to be you need to be div division considerate. For one, because if we're talking about a, a glute striated bodybuilder or WPD female, that's a lot different than, say, a, a wellness or bikini athlete that's not having to get absolutely peeled. You also have to be considerate, too, of that person's genetic propensity to get down to that body fat. Yeah. Someone might have an easy time getting from 8% down to stage lean versus that one person that has to get pretty fat, soft in the offseason. They probably had a lot more dieting adaptations that need to be removed. Yeah. So there's some nuance there about that individual. But in general... Uh, I would say after you say you've been kind of glycogen loaded, you know, you're back to this, this, this weight going into the show um, about a three to 5% over that body weight would be pretty reasonable. So let, let's say you were 200 pound loaded stage hydrate, you know, if you're hydrated, not counting, if you, whatever you're doing with manipulations, yeah. um, maybe, maybe you're 210 by, by week one. Mm -hmm. All right. So you allowed about a 5% increase to happen. Yeah. All right. So we had a little bit of a technical hiccup. You were saying 5% in the first week. So from 200 to 210. Yep. And then okay. um, from there, so we want to get you at pretty much out of that kind of that, we want to call it like a body fat danger zone. So it's okay. a very unsustainable body fat level, right? Hunger signaling is crazy high. You have, you know, usually have 
poor sleep, poor energy, high fatigue. We want to try to remove that situation as quickly as possible. Also, I think in that immediate first week post-show, if you're pushing a pretty aggressive surplus, it also makes someone much more liable to be more adherent versus, hey, we'll feed you really slow this first week. And then like most of the time, a lot of people eating off plan anyway. So it's yeah. like, let me just give them a lot of food up front, get body weight up quickly. And then after that first week, then we can slow down that rate. But again, it's going to be dictated off of what that person needs. Because the number one thing, and just like we had mentioned, you had mentioned way earlier about what John was doing as far as the mental break. The number one thing is is diet, like diet training, whatever it be, is, is adherence and sustainability. Yes. And that's going to be optimal for that person. I know what, what looks optimal in paper and research, et cetera, but it all doesn't matter if someone can't follow it. Mm-hmm. So you still have to cater towards that people's needs. Because I've had people that I've had to feed more aggressively and add body fat on faster than I would want to that I think would be optimal. But it's what they needed. What, um, what happens if somebody goes from 200 to 230 pounds in the first week? <laughs> how, ba- how bad? How bad? How bad is that? How bad is that? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's definitely not. Uh, for, so there's there's a health aspect to it, right? Sure. Um, for for one, you're you're ra- in the post show period. You have this, especially if you did some water manipulations. You're really setting yourself up for for rapid increases in glycogen water regain and all that's going to drive blood pressure stress on the organs electrolyte disturbances sky high yeah. so you talk about a dangerous situation that's it that post-show period so there, there is risk here and a lot of deaths that occur in bodybuilding are post-show yeah um with these le- electrolyte disturbances and people going and not drinking water post-show eating a ton of sodium laden foods then they reintroduce water they yeah. blow up with and blood pressure sky high and this is setting yourself up for, for a poor outcome. Then you have the user that's like, oh, I'm going to blast post-show to make the anabolic gains. What you're doing too, further increasing all that, that water reintroduction and increasing aldosterone levels. And, and, and it's just a dangerous situation you put yourself in. Is that period also, if you put on that kind of weight, is that period also going to be very dangerous for your kidneys? If you're reintroducing all that water and the blood pressure is through the roof, is that where a lot of guys are hurting their kidneys the most in that dehydrated post-show, you know, binge fest. Probably the biggest strain you put on your kidneys is in that little window. When you, for one, dehydration is terrible on the kidneys. So if you have someone that is using that approach with diuretics coupled on top of it and already on a high amount of PDs that are renal toxic on top of it, you're usually seeing kidney function decline throughout someone's prep in some instances yeah uh, I, this is not why the approach this is not just like hey i accept that sure. we're going to work around to not let that happen but this is how a lot of guys implement that then they just introduce a ton of water back in place when your body already has a poor ability to process it um, yeah yeah you could really put put some damage onto your kidneys so for one you have a, a pretty bad decline in, in health around this time yeah. but at the same time you're kind of cutting your off season short as far as the runway goes with rapid body fat accumulation okay. um, to where you, you get, you know, maybe you overshoot the point, right. Of, of, of the body fat comfortable spot. And yeah. so, yeah, you want to build some runway in your off season. Um, I think it could also quickly lead to that spot of, of insulin resistance and a lot of poor health markers when really post-show we want to be recovering the health markers and going on to binge eat. Is, yeah. is not going to do it. So it, it takes a step back. So wh- what do you do if you are that person? Should you go back to a diet? Well, no, no, you shouldn't. You should bring food to a maintenance level and be able to get to a sustainable spot around that body weight and let some of that water dissipate for one. But you definitely don't want to go back in deficit and go back to the binge restrict pattern and yeah. also back to going into all those negative prep adaptations. Sure. So you kind of have to tough it out with that person. Like, hey, listen, this isn't ideal. We're going to have to just keep food around a maintenance level until you're stable. And then we can go into your off season from there. Maybe at a later point, you might consider doing like a mini cutting phase, but that's definitely not the st- state to do it in mm-hmm. just immediate post show. Then with that same individual, you also want to address the psychology around that because this is, this is a dangerous situation for someone with binge restrict, like it's an eating disorder. Yeah. And what's, what's life for that person five years down the road when they're done with bodybuilding, you know, 
how are they going to handle that psychologically, that, that being able to eat in a normal lifestyle pattern yeah. and not have binge restrict or body image issues. It's so prevalent in this. So you have to make a, a, a route for that person to when they go into that situation of dieting, they're restricted, that they can have a control and not have that type of psychological drive to feel that emotional connection with food. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's tough, but I think that's the thing is like, okay, it happened, but we need to address this right away. Red flag. Sure. Sure. So first week, 10 pounds for mm -hmm. the ideal way. What do they do after that? How does it? Yeah. Uh, after that could be, we decrease the rate a little bit, maybe one to 2% body weight increase. So that might be two, two to three pounds the, the weeks after. And we just let that keep riding till we get that person to that comfortable body spot wherever that may be. And I think people get a little bit surprised that they're like, oh yeah, I feel really good until they get a little bit more body fat on. You're like, oh damn, no, I really feel good. Yeah. Um, another example was uh, wife Renee. Um, she just like last week felt like, I think she's like hundred percent now post-show and this has been 12 weeks. Yeah. And uh, this was her stage weight was around 125 and she's now 147. Sure. So, so this is like 22 pounds over, over, over stage weight for her. Yeah. Um, was that maybe 13, 14% over, over stage weight where all, great sleep, just great energy. Um, libido's fully returned training performance is sky high, just yeah. happy, energetic. Like, you know, that feel when you feel so, great. So those, are, so those are the cues someone's looking for sleep, feeling good. Mood is good. Strength is all there. Mm -hmm. Recovery from your workouts. Is there anything I'm missing of a cue that somebody's looking for? Because I, I think what most people are going to get from this is, okay, so everybody has a different point where they're going to perform at their best. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so now I need to know what that point is. So I guess we need to give them cues to say, okay, once you feel like this, that's probably your point. Yeah. And so I think, think about all, all the areas that are negative on prep and we want the opposite of those. So you no longer have food focus you know yeah. you're, you're thinking about food porn all day that's yeah. gone yeah um you have an, an increased energy level you don't want to lay around you don't have a high amount of fatigue and the big one is sleep um because yeah. that's a big derangement on prep sleep is normalized with duration and quality of sleep uh, a big one's libido because we lost a libido on prep and that's and i know that kind of blurs with um using physique drugs, but I think yeah. libido still, it, it should be returned because even then on prep, we're you're using a bunch of compounds, but you still don't have any sex drive. Yeah. So that, that should still uh, be returned. And then we should have good increases in training performance. Sure. And I think you can have those, those aspects there. You're probably in a spot where you have a good optimal off season to, to move into from there. And then I guess lastly, one last thing is, is your health markers that you're testing should all be returned to a baseline level um, or, or never moved from, from, from begin with. And that would yeah. be just a serum lab test, probably your analysis too, look, looking to make sure for, for kidney function. And, um, that's usually the, the markers that I'm going with and looking at blood pressure and blood glucose too. That's a, that's a weekly thing that I, that I monitor. Yeah. Um, so if all those things are in check, all right, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say, off. I'm going to say food focus and sleep. Yeah. Are, are my two, are my two biggest mark. I, I know everyone's going to have their own that, yeah. that they focus on more, but man, I can, I didn't even realize it until you said it. Food focus for me is such a big one because when I'm dieting, like I'm, people know me from the podcast. I'm a food guy. I love food. I love cheat meals. I love all that stuff. So when I'm dieting, I'm constantly like, okay, when's my next cheat meal? How can I, you know, I got to get through this diet. It's like food focus becomes so prevalent. And then post-show it's also there, right? Cause I'm trying to get back to that. Yeah. Now, I, now I can eat. So I'm eating everything. But I realized there's a point just after you said it, I realized that there's a, there's a point I get to usually five or six weeks after a show where I just don't care anymore. I can settle into my chicken and rice and ride that out, you know, ride out my normal diet for the whole off season. But it's usually after I've gained a certain amount of body fat. So I just didn't I never coincided that certain amount of body fat with the food focus mentally, but it's directly connected like when I get a little bit leaner, I all of a sudden start having cravings and thinking about food all the time. Yeah, a lot of these are just hormone driven. I mean, adipose tissue is not just this inert body fat store. Like it, it does regulate hormone function. A, a large one being leptin 
It has impacts on metabolic function, thyroid function. Then you have high levels of ghrelin when mm -hmm. you're dieted down, which is driving that hunger yeah. focus. Yeah. And, and all these hormones start normalizing and you start feeling normal again. Um, okay. So yeah, you have that, that hunger drop off. I know in my office, like, don't get me wrong. I get a food focus too, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I know it's like, you know, even when it's like, okay, it's going to be date night. Like you're, you're already looking at the menu like a week before. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you're like, all right, I'm going to have, I'm going to have like these four sushi rolls or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Then eventually you get to where you're like, okay, it's, it's date night and we're going It's like, ah, I don't care. I'll, you know, whatever. Yeah. I'll have two of these rolls. It's not a big deal. Yeah. F food is going to exist again tomorrow. I don't have to That's right. Yeah. That's right. So is it, so I, I know we keep getting away, but is it, <laughs> can you ever really escape your genetics then? Because if you're genetic, like it's funny because it, like if your genetics are like, let's say you're born into like a, a culture where people are generally have like Lebanese or Arabic people are generally like carry a little bit more body fat. Not that they're yeah. fat, but they're usually like, you know, a little bit heavier people. I mean, Italians are too sometimes just maybe because of the, our cultures and the way we eat. I don't know, but can you ever escape your genetics then? Because if your genetics are to the point where like, this is where you're comfortable. Yeah. You know, then you're, are you fighting a losing battle by trying to be 8% if you're not supposed to be? I, you, you, I mean, how you can, you can't change You can't change the genetics. Right. Yeah. So I think there's probably this little range that you can work within but outside of that, no, you're not going to be all of a sudden like, oh yeah, I'm good now. And I, I, I moved my body fat settling point. Cause this is a conversation. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I've heard that set, set point yeah. that you can change it. Um, and I think you could, you could shift it potentially because you get better for one at the psychological aspect, managing all the variables that um, you, you can play on. But again, those are still a largely under genetic control. And so is your body fat distribution and where you're comfortable at, at that body fat. So there's not much you can do. You're not going to completely change it. So in general, over someone's bodybuilding career, your, your journey, it's for the most part, you're going to be getting back to that similar range. And I think most of the preps are going to be probably pretty similar too. as far as like, if you're someone that's hard to pull down, you are probably never always going to be relatively harder than another person to pull down. Yeah. Um, and, and same goes off season. Like, yeah, you might still have this greater propensity for fat gain. There's stuff we can do, but again, it's not, it's not a mute point. It's not because we, and what is your genetics are? What it is like, what do you say? Like, Hey, Floyd, you, you don't have the best genetics for this. It's like, okay, well, I'm just not going to bodybuild. Like, well, no, yeah. you're still going to bodybuild. It is what it is. You just make the most of all the other variables. Yeah. So I, I don't, that's, I don't want to fester in genetics because it doesn't really matter. It just is what it is. And yeah. we, let's talk about the variables that we can actually do something about. Sure. Okay, so we've moved through the reverse diet, you, you know, two to three pounds after that first week, you got somebody getting ready to start their offseason, they've done their blood work and everything. So some key points that you mentioned in your Instagram post about off season, and how it should go. So the first one is consistency. Do you want to delve into this a little bit? Yeah, um, so the quickest way you're going to decrease the runway for your off season is accumulating body fat too quickly and getting to that stop point where you're like, Hey, I have to diet back down because I'm going to have to diet for a show at some point. And I can't be 30% body fat. And what happens within a prep is people get very regimented. You're counting all your food, your output, right? I know you got a step tracker. I know you're doing it for a little bit. Uh, so you have everything really, really dialed in and off season, you start losing some consistency within that. And you're like, ah, I'm going to have a little bite here and there. I'm not going to weigh this anymore. Hey, I'm not, oh, I, I didn't, I forgot my step counter this day. Screw it, whatever. I'm going to you know, not do as much cardio this day. The, the inconsistency starts to build in and you think it's nuanced enough to where it doesn't really matter, but it adds up to where now you have an inaccurate like calorie surplus every week. That's greater than what you wanted. And you start accumulating body fat faster than what you could be minimizing that and still optimizing muscle gain. Mm -hmm. Right. And so maybe you have even days where you have that larger calorie intake versus having more calories every day kind of spread out. And it's, it's in those moments where I think body fat accumulates really quickly. And I see people lose runway in the off season. Sure. So I want people to carry the good positive things that they built in prep into the off season with consistent routines of everything, training, meal timing, um, still accounting for things that we need to for having an accurate amount of calorie surplus and energy output. 
So just basically paying attention to everything at the same level you would when you were dieting. Cause I do notice people are like, obviously like you said, way more regimented uh, when yeah. they're dieting and then they kind of, you know, lose focus a little bit. So when you say, when you say uh, giving yourself more runway, you just mean not getting as heavy that you have to start your prep earlier. Correct. Is that what that means? A runway as far as like, say I, I needed, say you had 20 weeks of off season available and you accumulate so much body fat that you, you only got to 10 weeks and you're like, damn, I need to diet because yeah. I will have to prep earlier. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so you need to look at how much time do I really have and what's, what can I, what can I lay out game wise sure. in that time period? Uh, the second point you brought up was use a variety of tools to track your progress. Yeah. Just, just like you would within, um, your, your prep. And it's especially easy from a self-coaching aspect. I'm like, ah, I'm not going to take pics this week. Yeah. Um, let me just look at the abs. Looks good. I'm not going to put a posing suit on anymore. It's like, oh yeah, I'm not looking at my ass anymore. I can't so, do it. I, think, I can't do the posing suit in the off season. You do the <laughs> I still do it. Cause I, I it's just, I, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be routine. That's part of the routine, you know, yeah. and still get in those stage, those stage poses and yeah. see how they're looking and see if I'm filling the gaps where I need to. So every week I have my visuals just like I, I would in prep to compare. That's consistent. Um, I'm also, I'm a stickler on keeping trap of like a skin fold caliper sites. It helps me gauge kind of more objectively where body fat is um, and where I'm at for, for prepping. So sure. let me tell you what I mean here. Like for one skin fold just is accurate at measuring skin folds. It's not that great for telling me how much body fat I am. I don't really care. I'm a competitor, but I know like, Hey, when my glute skin fold is like, 4.5 millimeter like i am absolutely diced out yeah, right yeah, so yeah. i don't know like if i'm 12 weeks out and this is my skin fold roughly if i'm on on track here i see but also like i track my fattest spots so glutes lower back and upper back those yeah. are my three spots and i'll monitor those because you might look real good in a front shot but you might, you know it's going to come on fast on the back side for some people so for yeah. me i track that I'll track some circumference measurements um, more so for like over time. It's like, Oh, cool. Your waist is staying the same and arms are increasing. Okay. Yeah. But you have a variety of tools to kind of paint a full, full picture of how body composition is changing and, and how muscle gains going along with kind of looking at the log book too. Like you should be getting stronger over an off season. And if all these things are lining up and kind of give you some assurance that, Hey, you're doing what you need to do in your off season versus not tracking anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you are you are you optimizing your, your progress? Well, hmm. it might be hard to say. It's interesting because if I relate it to my own career, I always track the scale in the off season, obviously, and I always track. I would take pictures, but never imposing trunks, and I might not do all the poses because I, I know this one doesn't look as good in the off season as this one. <laughs> so I'm going to do a side chest. I'm not going to do a ab and thigh. Um, can't even get into my side try. I can't get into my. Side <laughs> but no but you know it's it, those are very very good tips because honestly if my coach made me put on my posing trunks every week i would probably be embarrassed to be you know 15 percent body fat i might be like oh shit i gotta i gotta watch what i eat a little bit more because this is gross so it, it, it'll keep you in check that's yeah. for sure um especially hitting your weakest shots like what, what do you want to get better at in a bodybuilder? That's right. Your, your weakest poses, your weakest body parts. So let's get in those poses that really expose you. Um, like I, I always make to sure to see like a front double, you know, overhead yep. abdominal, yep. a side try, yep. a rear lat spread. Hey, a lot of people can look good spreading fat around. Yeah. Uh, let's, see, <laughs> let's see a rear double bicep, you know? Don't, uh, don't get me wrong. I would take the shots, but I would just delete them before I sent them to anybody. So I was like, this is disgusting. No. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think, hey, make, make your weakest shots your best. If, you, if that's a goal in off season, let's make sure we're taking those picks and comparing them and filling the gaps where we need to. Very, very good point. Um, so the next point is, Avoid large cheat and binge meals, which we touched on a little bit, but if you want to yeah. clarify it a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there's some interesting, interesting studies on just one time feeding in individuals eating uh, 70%, 70, it was 78% over uh, maintenance calories, which is very reasonable. If you say your maintenance calories was 2000 calories and you go out and have like a 1400 calorie meal, you could do that. Right. Yeah. Easily. Um, the, the following day, they would have a, a drastic increase in blood glucose and blood insulin. 
So they, they had a decline in insulin resistance just after one meal. Yeah, so yeah. now you have this, the, going back to your, your normal diet, you have a decreased partitioning of food. Sure. Um, and so say you're doing that multiple times a week where you're spending a lot of time with high serum insulin levels. It just leads you to that poor kind of health status quicker. Usually gym performances, is the, the pumps aren't there. That's usually what yeah. I notice, notice yeah. quick. And then appetite starts really dropping down. And so we want to be able to really control these large, these times when we're trying to have like a large calorie input. So it's a, that's another interesting point because a lot of guys in the off season, including myself, when I was trying to get my biggest, let's say my weight is stuck, right? Let's say I'm stuck at two, a 290 and I'm really trying to get to 300. Um, I would have those large cheat binge meals on a Saturday night or something being like, no, it's okay. I gotta, I gotta boost my weight. So it's okay. I need the extra calories. And you're totally right. I would not ever get the same response in the gym when I was peak off season, having those large meals than I would when I'm dieting and lean and having a large meal and then getting a blasting full pump the next day. So does yeah. it, so uh, is there a difference obviously when you're lean and you're having that large meal versus uh, in the middle of the off season where you're already in a surplus all the time. Like, does that, oh, yeah. does that study account for when you're in a, in a deficit versus in a surplus? Uh, yeah. So I forget the, this is probably in a, a I think it's a normal population. I, yeah. I'd have to look back to say, but it definitely wasn't in a pre-contest bodybuilder yeah. situation yeah. when someone's extremely insulin, insulin sensitivity and you're adding in all this rush of carbohydrates and fats yeah. and, and sodium is a big driver in that too. Yeah. And you have that large increase in water levels the next day in the off season setting. It's just very different. You're, 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 you're not insulin resistant necessarily, but you're not like you are in prep. Yeah. So the response is going to be a lot lower. You're also not glycogen depleted. Like you could be in prep. Sure. So you're probably already pretty full in glycogen. So is an extra meal going to really pump you even more of glycogen or super no. compensate? No, um, you might get a little bit more sodium influx and have a little bit more water retention the next day. And that might, that might give you a little bit more pump, but I'd say, is that going to give you better performance in the gym? Not necessarily. Yeah. Uh, you know, pumps might just be kind of like the fun thing that happens, not necessarily a driver for hypertrophy. Yeah. Then also we're like, Hey, what about the health aspects around this, this too? So does the large cheat meal bring anything to the table? Um, I would rather have someone be able to eat more food over the day. Yeah. I think that would be more sustainable. And, and then still, if you like having untracked food and restaurant food, yeah, do it. Um, but I, I don't think it needs to be with the right intention of not like I need to push my body weight and this is how I want to do it. I think let's find a way to manage that same food amount, but throughout the entire week versus just in one moment. Sure. Yeah. I, do you think the term oversaturation makes sense? Because I used to feel like if I ate that meal, I was trying to eat right to boost my weight, I almost started to feel oversaturated. Like, I don't know what I'm trying to say, like glycogen wise. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, I just wouldn't feel like the carbs, the extra food, the extra carbs were doing anything. It was almost like my body was already at its peak saturation. I was already loaded and all this extra food just wasn't doing much. It was kind of just making me fatter, to be honest. Yeah, no, I think it's because what are you going to do once you're at this, this surplus amount, like, and you can only burn so much, so many glucose, so much fat at this one moment instance, where's the rest going to go? It's like, yeah, uh, yeah it's going to get stored. It's, it, it's going to, you can gain body fat like that, that quickly. Yeah. Um, so does it make sense to do it all in one moment versus trying to, I would put a lot around more around training, but sure. spread out throughout the week. And so I, yeah, I think, uh, like in, if you want to call it like an, an oversaturation point, I, I could, I could see that, but I think just this, this large amount of, of food influx in a moment, yeah. Is it just, it leads to more body fat gain for sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so your next point, number four was don't overdo the calorie surplus. This, yeah. is, this is something kind of I'm also, also guilty of. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of tied into the, the, the last point. Sure. Um, and uh, there's actually like, you know, looking at like how much body fat, how much, what should be your rate of gain? And it's going to be dependent on what your experience level is too. And so for someone that's newer, they're obviously going to have a much faster rate 
of progress than someone that's experienced. So that yeah. calorie surplus is going to be dictated around that too. So mm -hmm. for the new lifter, absolutely, they can have a much larger surplus because they're requiring to build something much faster. It's like trying to build a brand new house versus remodeling a bathroom. Um, you need a lot more materials, right, and workers. Uh, for the advanced lifter, remodeling your bathroom <laughs> isn't going to require uh, much much resources. Yeah. Uh, so that calorie surplus doesn't need to be quite as large, and you're not going to be gaining quite as fast. So maybe you have someone that is at this 600 calorie surplus while the advanced lifter might be around that 300 calorie surplus. Now, there's lots of situations to change within that. Um, if someone is coming from a detrained state, yeah, uh, they, they likely could have a faster rate of gain. If someone's moving into a enhanced state from natural, like absolutely, you're kind of sure. opening the doors to being a newbie again, um, or just escalating gear in general, that might um, increase that rate too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, someone that's obese, they could probably recomp even being in a calorie deficit. So there's like some situations that, um, you know, that surplus might, might change to where you, you could be even at main sort of deficits and be gaining muscle mass. That's yeah. possible. You don't have to be a surplus, but for the most part, we do have to be in a surplus for someone that's nailing all the variables. And that should be dictated along with what your gym rate progress is. If you're seeing training performance increase and that you're looking at your visual, you say, okay, I'm not getting too fat. I can, <laughs> I can keep, yeah. I can keep at this surplus, or maybe I should be, be dialing it back. And, um, I would say you let the body fat come on. Cause if you are trying to say, Hey, I don't want to see any body fat gain week to week. You're probably going to cut yourself short yeah. and, uh, and not have any gain happen. So you absolutely do need to allow some, I think that's what people don't like. Like, give me the answer, John. What's the, what's, I don't want this gray nuance bullshit talk around, not a hard number. So I don't have a hard number. Um, so I'd say, Hey, if you're, uh, if you're seeing like progress getting every single week in the gym, you're probably someone that's pretty newer to the gym, but someone that's advanced, gosh, maybe you're adding two and a half pounds on the bar every week, maybe every other week, yeah. if you're lucky, yeah. um, then you're probably going to have a slower way to rate gain. And that for someone that's advanced, gosh, that might be, if, you, if you, I'd say you'd be lucky if you're putting on half a pound every two weeks or something of muscle mass, maybe like imagine yeah. that if you, if you even gained a pound of muscle over, over five months of off season, right? Well, I remember the whole year, 12 pounds of muscle. I remember um, so Dorian Yates used to say, Dorian Yates used to say, Two and a half, two to two and a half pounds a month was the max somebody could put on. Like that's if they're doing everything perfect, but that's still, you know, that's 24 pounds in a year, which is kind of unheard of. It's more like a beginner would put that on. Yeah. 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 So, I would say so. So think about your advanced guys, you know, like yeah. what maybe five, five, seven pounds a year, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so how do you spread that over an off season? Say, and, and what are these guys? Maybe six, seven month off seasons. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe 20, and, 20, 25 weeks. Right. 25. Yeah. Right. So, um, so, so and then you got to ha have a little fat on top of that. Right. So yeah. you're not going to have pure muscle gain. It's probably, you know, maybe a, a you know, a, a, say, say, even if you're lucky 50, 50 fat to yeah. muscle. Yeah. So yeah. it's 10 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Know, so uh, over six things. months. The two things I grabbed from that were don't be scared to put on body fat because that's, I think is a very prevalent nowadays is guys are not making the gains they should every year muscle wise, yeah. because they're too scared to put on a little bit. And I'm not saying get fat, but a little bit of body fat. And, um, the second thing was, I'm very happy that you, <clears throat> that you, um, made the distinction between advanced and beginner because most of the people that message me and some of the people that watch the show are just starting bodybuilding or just getting into it in some way. And they're trying to stay lean and it's even more detrimental for the beginner Big when they, out. when they stay lean, because now you're really just doing yourself a disservice because when you're a beginner is when you could soak up all the food. Cause I remember my first couple of years of bodybuilding, I was eating, man, I was eating food out of cans and stuff. That was like, you know what I mean? I wasn't eating anything fresh or organic or like grass fed. And I was putting on a ton of mass. So like that first, the, like you said, the beginner versus the advanced lifter is going to be very different. Yeah. I think too, for these beginners, like I, I know a lot of people want to, I want to get on stage. I want to compete and they want to do it often. It's like when you're younger beginner and starting out, like 
just to spend time off season, spend a few years, not even competing. Yeah. And then it should be competing infrequently. Sure. Um, and then as you're getting more advanced to that muscular level and experience competing, then you compete a lot. Like when you're a pro, yeah, you can do all these pro shows. Cause you don't have the, you don't need the time to put on that tissue anymore. It's there. Yeah. Um, but when you're a beginner, that's the opposite of what you want to be doing and try to stay lean all the time. So I think you're absolutely right. Like it is, it is a disservice. And when I, when I started out, I, I was doing, one show a year, if that, um, and, and that's when I was making most of my progress yeah. as well. Yeah, taking me too. That long duration time. Yep. Uh, point number five that you brought up was keep in your cardio, which is a big, big one that I think people could, uh, benefit from. Go ahead. Yeah. I don't want to put out there like doing cardio is going to keep you leaner. Um, because it still comes down to total calorie intake you're because are you going to partition more towards muscle than to fat doing cardio you're you're burning some fat and i i don't think that necessarily holds true um absolutely like resistance training can cause some good partition towards muscle and away from fat but more so keeping in cardio because for some some people i work with their food intake is so low because they're so sedentary yeah and then they're not getting enough food because of that so I think for these individuals, it's good to keep a high activity level, whether it is cardio because of your time schedule or just staying active. Other people are already way too active. They might have a very you know active job and that could be a hindrance mm -hmm. and they have to eat so much food. It's unsustainable and they don't recover from training. That's kind of the opposite. We just want to try to get these people yeah. lower in activity. So there's, there's, there's some spectrum within that, but I think just staying active um, also keeps digestion moving. And that's one thing that I've used for, for guys eating a lot of food is like, Hey, just take a five minute walk after a meal, yeah. keep digestion move along. So you have the ability to push into those higher food amounts that requires to grow. Um, then also, I think it's just better from, from a healthy health standpoint. And lastly, I also think amount of, well, actually there's two more points <laughs> uh, to have some type of cardiovascular fitness is beneficial while you're training in hypertrophy rep ranges like doing a set of squats and then your tax for like six yeah. minutes yeah. it's like okay now you're getting to like volume levels that you just can't handle because of your fitness and so keeping a level of that is important i think for keeping training efficient yeah um, and then also i think it makes the transition back into a prep um kind of move out the gates right away um some people use the term metabolic flexibility that you're kind of able to switch between burning fuel sources yeah i've, I've had some clients where you you put them into a deficit or you add cardio in, like nothing really happens for the first few weeks and then finally you have to really push them then it kind of gets moving yeah. and i think you're kind of gaining some of these adaptations that were lost uh from pulling back on a lot of the cardio and stuff so i think keeping a baseline in helps you move more fluently into a contest prep so i think it's not necessarily like hey this is going to keep you from gaining fat but it has a, i think a lot of indirect things that help you just have a productive off season and be a better bodybuilder once you're moving in into a prep yeah i think my main reasons i kept cardio i, I didn't early in my career because i thought of i had the mindset like don't burn any calories sit on your ass and, <laughs> yeah. and get as big as you can no but once i learned a little bit more and i started to keep cardio in i did it more for appetite and for health I was like, it's probably good. Just keep my, you know, get my heart rate moving a couple times a day and almost more so for appetite. Cause I had so much trouble eating. Like you said, you'd have your guys go for a five minute walk. I yeah. felt like, I felt like doing that extra cardio helped me get more food in every day. Yeah. If you, think, if you get to a spot with poor health and low appetite, what do you usually have to do to counter that? Well, yeah. you usually have to pull back. Yeah. Pull yeah. Back, pull back drugs, pull back food are you now in a productive off season anymore? Like, no, yeah. <laughs> you're having to cut it short. So it's a way to keep extending out this off season and being productive. So, uh, right. In indirectly, it doesn't, um, Oh, good. No, it is more so indirectly. It helps you continue to be productive and building, yeah. building tissue. So, so the, I don't, I don't want to, I'm, I'm happy you came on. We've gone way over the time. I apologize, John, but, um, to so, summarize, yeah. to summarize the, the podcast, which I, I find, very helpful. Most of what you've said today to me is revolves around productivity and not as much numbers. So like most people want to put a hard number to, to yeah. how, how much cardio should I do? How much should I eat? How much should I sleep? How much? 
and kind of from what I'm gathering from what you're saying and correct me if I'm wrong, but like most of it is just going to be dependent on these performance factors, whether they performance or recovery factors, whether they be sleep or training performance or uh, appetite or any of these, is that kind of the correct way somebody should take what we're saying today? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you, obviously you have to put some numbers down. Of course. And yeah. there should be some starting points, but, but what do you do from there? I think looking at more of these other subjective and some are, are even objective factors is just like what you would do with coaching someone. Yeah. You set someone up with some numbers that you think are pretty close to where they need to be at. And then you, you look at how they're performing. How are you sleeping? Um, how is appetite and in, in, in digestion going? Uh, what are health markers like? What are, what are the visuals looking like? What are your caliper sites, et cetera, looking like? You have this full picture kind of painted. Then we adjust those numbers for that individual from there. Yep. So I know people want the number, but really it's the response to that number and the adjustment the, yeah. where the really value is in that. And uh, so I agree. It's, it's like you need to get to a state within your off season or post contest where you have, you, you feel great, you're sleeping great and you're performing great. And that's when you're going to have a productive spot to be in for, for the off season. And, and the, the numbers are, are going to be what they are to, to meet those conditions. Yeah. So what's the next show? What are you getting ready for now? Oh man. After uh, prepping my whole life <laughs> <laughs> for a whole year, <laughs> man, I haven't had like a, a, a good off season in a long period of time. And my, um, you know, my roughly stage weight was, you know, two Oh six ish. The low that I hit was like, you know, waking up fast and lowest body weight I hit was two Oh three. Okay. So I'm, I'm 212. I have some, I have some area to, to increase. So I need that time duration. This is just what we're talking about. Yeah. Mapping yeah. The timeline for what is reasonable tissue gain. And I think, Hey, I probably need seven months to bring myself up to that 212 spot. I think that's yeah. reasonable. Um, and so then how long do I need to prep for, et cetera. And that kind of puts me into the fall. Yeah. And I was like, well, hell, I don't want to do, it was like Texas was a show that's that's the last one in the U S which is shitty because it's August to December to the Olympia. It's like, damn, that's like 16 weeks to hold. Like you can't, what can you do with that? And then there's Romania or Japan and Spain, I think all kind of close together. It's like, well, shit, I, that, that fits my timeline. It's more important that I see the progress I want and kind of really max and, and bring my, I feel at my best to 212. Mm-hmm. So it's probably going to be something like that, like uh, Romania or I had Romania in mind, but I saw the other shows pop up on the calendar, but then it's like Romania and then like three weeks to Olympia. Of course that gives me like one shot. Yeah. I'm putting but all I, your eggs in one basket. But you know, it's just more important to me that I, I make progress and sure. that I bring that to stage. If I don't win, whatever, but I can at least, you know, have satisfaction that, I, I uh, put all these all these things I talk about to practice and show that like yeah hey I I made these these changes and brought my best at two twelve and that's yeah. uh, that's what I want to do so probably probably in the fall okay um, with Ren- with Renee I don't know if she'll even compete this year La- this last year was pretty uh, pretty taxing on her mentally she just wants a good break so yeah we'll, we'll see it'd be nice to just prep alongside together because of all the things that we had already mentioned but. Yeah. We'll see where that goes. All right, John. Well, listen, I appreciate the time and I wish you luck in the off season. Hopefully we can do this again on some other topic. Yeah. But, uh, thank, to. thank, thank you very much for uh, educating us all on off season. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, no, pre- appreciate you having me on and love to do it any, anytime. Okay, brother. We'll talk soon. All right. Let all right man. Take it easy. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, share with your friends and like the video. And if you get a chance, check out the description for all the different links to all the different places you can find Hostile and myself. And lastly, check out Hostile.com for our new line of supplements and all of our apparel and gear. Thanks again for watching.